This Week in Startups is brought to you by Tommy John, the revolutionary men's underwear brand that's redefined comfort. Go to tommyjohn.com slash twist for 20% off your first order. And Dollar Shave Club. See why over 3 million members love Dollar Shave Club. Get your first month of the club for free. Just pay shipping. dollarshaveclub.com slash twist. And IBM Smart Camp, powered by Launch. Over 20 cities worldwide. Get mentored, pitch on stage, compete to win investment from Jason, and become IBM Global Entrepreneur of the Year. Apply at smartcamp2016.com. Thanks to Jay Martin for his iTunes review, where he said Twist is the best podcast for startup news out there. Leave your review on iTunes and be featured on the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and we do the show twice a week. There are some episodes that have become legendary on the show. Among them, when we had Travis from Uber on, uh, and of course, when we had Chris Sock on, relatively unknown investor at the time uh, for two or three hours. And that became one of the most popular, not the most popular episode of the show ever. Well, here we go. Today I'm in Los Angeles and I'm taping a couple of episodes and my good friend, co-investor in many companies, uh, Chris Saka is with me again and his partner in Lowercase Capital, Matt Mazio, who actually does all the work. This is true. Welcome back to the program. <laughs> right on. <laughs> uh, after that incredible, it's got like an unknown guy. He doesn't do any more work. And then they got this guy who does minutes. all the work. Yeah, the, the ball busting right now, huh? It has to start with just <laughs> strong chop lead. busting. But um, seriously, welcome Do you know how hard it is to get out of bed in the morning and put on one of these shirts specifically to come here? I mean, it's Yeah, it's amazing. incredibly easy. I haven't worn pants in a couple of weeks. So <laughs> <this> is, <laughs> it's... Being an investor is easy, or is it hard? What do you think, Chris? Is it easy or is it hard to be an investor? I mean, that's a legitimate question. I mean, let's frame it. What are we going to frame it against? Like washing dishes? It's yeah. a cakewalk, right. right? And I think that's one of the reasons why we have a rule about only working with entrepreneurs who've had real jobs, who've had real life experiences, who've been exposed to the human condition, not just in our country, but outside of our country. You've been exposed to poverty and understand how fortunate all of us who are in this game really are. Yeah. That said, it's an exhausting job. You right. are constantly competing to be at the forefront of knowledge, to push your own thinking, to learn as much as you can, to not miss out on anything, to deal with the emotional turmoil of everything from, from FOMO to coaching other entrepreneurs, to knowing you've screwed something up, to taking incredible risk and letting it all ride. And you know, most investors, particularly early stage investors who start their own funds, have a lot of their own money yeah. into the game, probably all the eggs in one basket. And so it's a real job and it yeah. comes with a lot of stress. Now, most investors don't want to show that vulnerability. They don't want to show that it's that taxing, but there are some incredible ups and downs where you deeply, deeply start to doubt yourself along the way. If, if I think if this job felt like work, it'd feel like an incredible amount of work. If it feels like just something you do because you love doing it and because you, you wake up and because you can't stop yourself from like, staying up on the products and actually playing with the products and meeting people. If you get high on like meeting people and having a conversation and talking about what's happening next and actually helping those companies come to life, then it's like the greatest gig of all time. It doesn't feel like a job. The second that feels like work though, I imagine it's overwhelming. It hasn't for me, but you're enthusiastic. How long have you been doing it now, Matt? Uh, at lowercase four years, four years. Well, it's funny when Matt, when Matt joined uh, a few years ago, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm more introverted than I think people would ever give me credit for. Uh, you've called me a misanthrope at times, but <laughs> I, I generally, I, I don't feel like I'm moving the needle for any of my projects when I'm stuck in a meeting. And so when Matt joined, I gave him all my tips for avoiding meetings. I mean, step number one was leave San Francisco, move to Truckee, and yeah. don't let anyone know your address. Just completely drop out of the game. Right. And then what I did was I picked and chose the people I wanted to build relationships with and invited them up for quality time, but otherwise, I did no coffees, no meetings, et cetera. So when Matt joins, I'm like, hey, here are some of my tips for getting out of meetings. And Matt, who had come from CAA, where he was a power, you know, Hollywood agent. I mean, agent. CAA, yeah. your job is meetings. Yeah. yeah. If, you have a, if you have an agent, you walk in the room and every agent in the firm has to come in that room. Every seat has to be filled. No, that's a little entourage. You, it's an ex you know, I, I, Somebody showed me yesterday a picture, a director showed me a picture of going into Endeavor and literally- Was it a big director? No, it was like a medium director, and he, there were literally 20 people around a table, yeah, and looking happened. at him, and he took a picture. Yeah, that's happened for sure. No, it's, yeah. but, 
but he, he interrupted me. He's like, Chris, you don't understand. I love meetings. Like I do a couple of breakfast, maybe a lunch or two. I'll work out with some guys as one of my meetings. I'll get <laughs> drinks later and yeah. I'll just stay up till four in the morning and get all my email done That's along the I way. Work. And I'm like, that yeah. sounds torture. I love, to I love the conversation. I love the back and forth. Yeah. I, I think one of the hard, if there is a challenge, this job is that it can be isolating a little bit. And yeah. that's why I'm lucky to have Chris and friends and you and yeah. other people who like enjoy the jam. Right. And I love that about this gig is having like the conversation about what's next and thinking about it and how you can improve it. And I think that comes from meeting people. For me, that comes from like a back and forth, a dialogue, a conversation that happens. And it's often in person. If yeah, but it's not 12 of those a day. So no, I love I'm, the jam I'm a session. Insane. I mean, that you and I met in a jam yes. session. Yeah. South by, you and I have gone yeah. deep. That's how I built that friendship, you know, uh, the relationship with Travis that led to our investment yeah. there and Kevin Systrom and Instagram and Evan Williams at Twitter. But each of those are, was the result of really substantive, come stay at my house for a weekend and let's go hiking or let's ski, let's drink beers, let's have a dance party, let's spend too much time in the hot tub types of interactions, those types of friendships that happened before we ever did any investments. It's, you know, in the, in the years, when I was at Google, I was one of Google's outward facing people. If you want to do business with Google, you emailed me and my email address is public. And so I just spent all my time playing defense to all of that inbound bullshit. And after I left Google, that email was still pretty public. And so yeah. people were still spamming me with all of their stuff. And I found I could spend an entire day at Brick House on Brandon, just literally lining up from nine to five, meeting, 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 meeting. At the end of the day, I'd be exhausted you would look busy. I yeah, I'd yeah. be fat because I just ate. You know, I ate something during each one of those meetings. Yeah, I I would be tired. I'd be losing my voice, and I'd be like, "What did I just accomplish?" Other than give all these people feedback on their startups, but all this stuff that I want to do, the writing I want to do, the ideas I want to work on, the research I want to work on, the workouts I should be doing, the hikes I should be on, the people I should be out dating. All of that was falling by the wayside because I was just responding to inbound all the time. And so and every time you take one of those meetings, it fires off more meetings and more follow up because what happens in the meeting, we discuss what other meetings the person should take and yeah. we should discuss what's yeah. the next step. Yeah. Because that's what they always leave you with. Every Somebody gave these founders this advice. When the, when the investor declines, ask them for three more meetings and friends. I'm like, how is that good advice? Well, I don't, we tend to not pass along anything that we've declined on and as a principle, unless yeah. we think look, there's a specific reason we decline it. Like we don't invest in weed startups. And so, uh, you know, if I know somebody who does do that stuff then, and they ask for an intro there, then I'll hand sure. it off. But we just, if I've made a qualitative decision that your thing is not a fit for us, or I don't believe in you, the team or the product, et cetera, I'm Ooh. not going to go pawn that off on other friends because yeah. I know the cost it has. And I think that's why we have great relationships with other investors and we know that we don't yeah. waste their time. I, if I'm going to send something to you, it's like, it has to be really good. And I know that he's the guy who's going to meet with them and you're going to just look at the website. That's at least my <laughs> perception of you're going to like peruse it and just see if it appeals to you in some way and that you're going to go deep um, in a meeting with them. Am I correct? Well, here's the idea is that I think as my career developed and as my life situation changed, I started making money. I have a great wife. I have these kids. Like I've never swiped left or right on a girl in an app. Yeah. Matt certainly has. Are you yeah. suggesting that <laughs> yeah. I swipe oh, right Are you left? kidding me? I have ridden in the car with you. I mean, you're now in love, et cetera. But I there, am there, in love. There have been many times, right? there are many times where he was yeah. swiping left I and right. I love you, Jess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like the Snapchat guys. Came I wonder to, if he still got Tinder on his phone. It, absolutely not. No, right. delete it. Is that like the thing that you millennials have to do when you get in a committed relationship? Yeah, it used to be Facebook official. Now you delete every, every, and the step beyond that is deleting face, uh, Tinder, Raya, and Whis all the rest. Whisper. Does anyone whisper anymore? Yeah. Or am I sound uh, old? That's when a I different, say that's a different, okay. type that's of a product. different purpose. Okay. I have, I'm an investor in Whisper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but you know, there was a, there was a really pivotal moment when the Snapchat guys came up to me once and said, we're a big fan of your work. We love your ethos. We really want you involved in our company. I was like, the dick pics? Like, I don't know if I would, you yeah. know. And so I said no to them. And then wow. I went back and I told Mazio and he was apoplectic. He goes, what the fuck? You know, and by then we had missed our window. Right. And so what I realized is that- now you're using it every day. Your wife uses it. Everybody yeah. in your firm uses it all day long. Of course. Of course. It's a great product. And, right. I, and by the way, it's a different product than the one I passed on. Right. You had but, the ephemeral message product yeah, you're yeah. talking about where the message disappeared, yeah. but now stories. Stories is, like, is genius. It's, like it's completely different. format that we've seen. Uh, I don't know any company that, that reinvents itself faster and more efficiently than those guys. They're amazing. Yeah. And, and so, before they have to, right? Yeah. And, and by the way, we're not investors at all or anything right. like that. I, I'm just really impressed by them. But the point was, 
that was one moment that drove home. The initial meeting is not my strong point anymore. Right. I am not the user of this stuff. Like Matt goes to like League of Legends tournaments. You pay money to sit in a stadium and watch a bunch of guys play esports against each other. I and, love I mean, diving deep in that world. We've now made three investments in that ecosystem. We, so right, I, and you and, frankly, and I've never played any of them. Think it's dumb. <laughs> well, no, I. I mean, look, look, Matt, Matt, you are so obsessed. I mean, be honest, like fess up. What, what, how deeply involved are you in esports at this point? At this point, we've made two investments. Uh, and what I made are a, they? Let's, let's get the investment. We, so we made an investment to a company called Smash GG. They power some of the biggest tournaments and events okay. uh, in so and around like esports. the intranet software or the, the <laughs> yeah, management software? and the software. compendium and all the sort of Got monetization it. for the pa uh, for the players. Okay. And then, <laughs> and then we made an investment in Mob Crush. Uh, what you, is Mob Crush? Mob Crush that is a feature today, by the way. Today, it's actually the very, you can download, if you download iOS 10, you're checking out new apps in the App Store. It is the number one featured app. What does, they, why do they people allow for, Mob Crush? Uh, they're the only player that has replay kit uh, integration, where if you're playing a game now, you can live stream directly from that game to the world. On your phone? On your phone. So no really? tethering, yeah. none of that. You go into, also, like, it, so what I thought was interesting is it's if you're playing an iPhone casual game, so you're playing Clash of Clans. Yes. Yeah. Vainglory. So, and so you watch people like the best guys in the world play Clash of Clans. And, yeah, you and learn then, how to and play. And then there's a huge audience watch, like a huge audience. There's 5,000 people right. I checked it actually because I checked the feature. There's 5,000 people right now watching somebody play Vainglory on Mob Crush on the platform. But if you think about. So you would look at these the investments format. and you would just be like, nonsense. I can't, well, I, I can't I vibe it. And I, you wouldn't I just write don't the think check. I'm a great judge and arbiter of that stuff anymore. Like I don't game. You so know, when he I, brings you those things, how do you just trust them? Or you ask him to write a memo? How do you, with your partner, <laughs> what do you, how do you, like, is there a deal memo? How does it work? How do you, uh, no, we, no, we, we, you just tell him write the check? No, 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 look, we, we have very complimentary skills here. So what I was going to say is, and compliment to the first meeting is where my value comes in is there are very universal principles in building all of these businesses ultimately. And so while I might not be a great arbiter of that original idea, I certainly am valuable in determining whether your story and describing it to a mass audience is working. Mm. I'm certainly good at, at sussing out, are these the guys and gals with the hustle? Do their backgrounds yeah. and the way they are pitching this and the way they, they seem to be of cl collaborating to date, are they indicative of the kind of teams that we see win? Right. You know, are they really when we talk to them, are they evoking a, a visceral reaction to the fact that they're going to be the people who are going to take this all the way? You know, where I specialize at helping them hire the next two people into their company or convincing the, the, the hire who's on the fence that this is the company to join. We're, we excel at convincing the next yeah. investors to come yeah. in, you know, yeah. and really start to shore this up. If you're worried about your communications or press strategy, that's something that's universal. And I have yeah. years and years of experience and all those connections. And so that's why I think our approach has been really complimentary is that the more of these companies you see, the less different the, the company building part really is. But that said, I'm just, I'm not a kid. I, you know, I, here's a great you're example. Not single. You're if I yeah. if I see yeah. an app in the app store at 499, I'm like, okay, whatever, 499. And yet yeah. we know that is a huge <laughs> tipping point where a lot of people, millions and millions of people abandon that option like 499, what the hell? Yeah. And so that's real money. And so I'm not in a great place to determine pricing strategy for you know the the vast majority of of users these days because I just don't care about it. All right. When we get back from this break, I want to talk about uh, what most people consider a complete uh, and utter um, disaster at this point, one of your most famous investors, which is Twitter. And I want to know if you think that this company is dying and if it's going to be sold and how it might be fixed, or if you think it's still a great company. Uh, and I want to talk about a product you made internally that I personally think is the most brilliant thing I've ever seen a VC firm build, which is lowercase alpha. When we get back on This Week in Startups. Hey everybody, I want to tell you about the upgrade cycle. Yes, we upgrade our phones, we upgrade our computers, but when's the last time you upgraded your underwear? I recently did, and I wear Tommy John's exclusively. It is a revolutionary men's underwear product. I wear it, and it's perfect. I wear the boxer briefs, you might be boxers, other people might be briefs, I split the difference. I like boxer briefs. They're so comfortable, they're so lightweight, tons of breathability, which gentlemen, Let's be honest, breathability is important. It never rides up your leg and the waistband never rolls down. I met the founder actually of Tommy John and he has ground out this business 
from revenue and iterated on this product. He is obsessive. He's a maniac when it comes to product design. And he has applied his product design to underwear, t-shirts, socks, all this great stuff. And really, they are much more uh, than just underwear. I have the undershirts and they are beautiful, like a second skin. If you want to wear an undershirt and have multiple layers, because layers are for players, we all know that. And you see those v VC pictures. Those VCs have the undershirt, huh? Then they have the shirt on top of it. Then they have a sweater. Then they have a blazer. Sometimes you'll see some of those VCs with a scarf. Three, four, five layers if you want to be in the game. Layers are for players. And it's patented 21st century technology and design. It's impossible to get a wedgie if you wear Tommy John's. It's the best pair you'll ever wear or it's free. That's their guarantee. The best pair you'll ever wear or it's free. Tommy John, no adjustment needed. All right, here's your call to action. This is the important part. Go to tommyjohn.com slash twist. Go to tommyjohn.com slash twist to experiencing life change comfort, and you'll get 20% off your first order. You can't do better than that. tommyjohn.com slash twist. tommyjohn.com slash twist to experience life-changing comfort and get 20% off your first order. Welcome to the Tommy John family. It's a great startup and they make great products. Get in there and upgrade your underwear, socks, and your undershirts. Great product, love it. I'm, real, I'm wearing it right now. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guests are Matt Mazio and Chris Saka of Lowercase Capital. Wait, did he just get top billing right there? Is that yeah, what happened? I believe that's, that was a, I'm try, the kid's going to get... I know the kid's going to get a little beat up on the program. Am I going to get beat up? A little that, haze. Just tell me it was alphabetical order. Uh, Mazio <laughs> or S. Work. Yeah, yeah, it is alphabetical right. by last name. All right. um, sure. And uh, they are with Lowercase Capital. Of course, um, Chris is a very famous investor. Uh, Matt is pretty unknown, up-and-coming investor. <laughs> I, think, I think earlier in the podcast, though, you took credit for making me a famous investor. I think that's what you're yeah, trying to say. Yeah, basically, I was saying, like, nobody yeah. really knew. Yeah. But All right, it I just is, wanted did, to be clear. It, it is interesting <laughs> how one investment can change everything in your career, and you really have two life-changing ones, I think. Um, Twitter, I mean, there's others, but Twitter specifically... And uh, Uber are just two massive, massive wins. I mean, Instagram, we were an investor in as well. Yeah. yeah. And so that's Instagram a, bought me a house. So that was pretty life changing. It's, it's pretty life changing. Heroku bought me another house. So that yeah. was definitely life changing. Right. <laughs> so Twilio has been unbelievable. It seems for like, me. A, it seems like I mean, a good was, one for you. I was right. first money in an advisor to Twilio. So amazing. Yeah. Right. So, so those are all home runs, but you have two grand slams. Look out, optimizely Docker. I'll take them. I'm just talking about the, you know, the decacorns are the ones that will return a magnitude of all of that. Yeah, Come depending on. upon where your basis was in those things, right? Yes. Yeah. So basis being yeah, where you I mean, got in. Yeah. Remember, Twitter has been in a phenomenally life changing event for me, sure. and and at a few different, you know, I was in that first round. I started buying, I was an advisor to the company, so I got extra yep. shares that way. And then I started buying up everybody's shares along the way. So by the time the IPO, yeah. my affiliated funds had 18% of the company. Wow. So uh, that said, you know, the original valuation of that very first round was $20 million at right. a time when that was an absurdity. I think that's why Sequoia didn't invest actually and Fred Wilson got the deal was he was willing to pay the 20 million pre and the 30 million post. I mean, there was a lot of deep belief in Evan Williams. Sure. You know, Jack Dorsey blogger. was still unknown there. He's a talented guy, but he's still unknown then. Uh, there was, we were kind of taking a flyer on Evan Williams and a lot of us thought, hey, this is a fun product. That the, uh, there's no one with a straight face who can tell you they knew how big it was going to be and how useful it was going to be and how much information would be in there. It was fun. And so, but that was an incredibly high pre-money valuation at for something at that in that era. It's 2005, 2006 era. Yeah, 2006, I think, yeah. is when they raised. And yeah. so, you know, comparatively, during that same time, the Twilios of the world were raising at a two. Right. You know, Uber, our four. original basis was just under four. Yeah. You know, under four million. Three, seven. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. so and Five. so that's what's funny is the multiple, and, the, and then you have to take into account the amount of dilution. You know, right. we, we have companies who aren't doing so well. They go into their Series A and they lose 40% of the company on... They won. And so it doesn't even matter how cheap it was in the beginning. You just get an incredible haircut. Right. And so I'm, I'm very proud of how we've done on paper, or even in realized returns with the Twitters and the Twilio's and the Ubers of the world. But we've made bank on some of these companies where we get in an incredibly low valuation. Right. Make an oversized okay. bet because we believe in the product and the team. And then sell it for a hundred million dollars, and they don't get magazine covers. Right, but but you absolutely life changing for a guy yeah. from you yeah. know who grew up in a small town outside Buffalo, right. New York. Right, and I think that's something that's target, lost. You have a target 
ownership percentage these days. You try to own 10%, you try to own 20%, or you just want to be in the business with the best Dude, founders. The, all those rules, all those rules do is serve to give people reasons to miss out on getting rich. It's yeah. it's fascinating. <laughs> like we 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 see investors are like, look, I won't do a deal if I don't get the board seat. And we're like, look, in the even in at the, the seed stage. In yeah. the earliest days, you either have a relationship with that entrepreneur where you're providing value and you yeah. feel like you're getting along, or you don't. And the board seat is not going to change that because in the seed stage, that board member, that investor board member has no control. They, they're yeah. overridden by the founder's votes and stuff. So literally you can't formalize a collaborative friendship. Right. Paper can't force that relationship. Yeah. And yet we see so many people like, I can't do your deal if I don't get a board seat. And we're like, okay, well, we'll just go in and, and hang out with these guys and collaboratively work and give them advice and hope they take it, et cetera. And we'll make all the money. Yeah. Okay. So good luck. We've even written smaller checks that, you know, most funds wouldn't consider like meaningful to the fund, knowing that once that company starts hitting their uh, their marks and we're close to it, we can lean in right. and we'll aggressively lean in into companies that start to really hit it. What's you've written in the last like year or two? What, what is the smallest size? We, we just did a, a 150 into a pre-seed at a company that's sub four. Put 150K. 150K into a $400,000 round at a $4 million valuation from like killer entrepreneurs, seasoned founders, and, uh, you know, that's a, well, I mean, look, we have a few rules, uh, that aren't about, uh, check size, but you know, first of all, we only invest in companies. We'd be proud to tell our families and our daughters and our wives, et cetera, that we invested in. Right. So when ultimately these things return and, and we end up being lauded for however we've done, I want to be able to look everyone I know straight in the eye and say, I'm really proud of the impact that thing has had on the planet. And I don't want to yeah. be embarrassed by any of it. So, uh, and, you know, we invest in things that we feel we can personally move the needle. Mm. So instead of just throwing darts at a board, like in the public market, I want to know that this is a company that we can help. Right. We know exactly how to be helpful. Why is that important? Because you, if you're not helpful and you made a bunch of money, wouldn't that be a fine outcome? No, but what happens is it's a lot less likely you're going to make a bunch of money ah. if you're not helpful. So it's a right? signaling thing. And so it's not even just a signaling thing. It's just, first of all, I sleep better at night knowing that I have control over my own destiny, mm -hmm. that I can I can take a company that's good already and hopefully make it great. Mm -hmm. And so uh, and so that makes it, you know, I've, I've been a public markets trader. That's the worst I've ever felt. You see red on the board yeah. and there's nothing you can do about it. Except, Except beat yourself up that maybe you're wrong on this yeah. one, right? And so, but with our companies, I feel like I, and, and we are de-risking it in a way. We see that the ways we can help are the ways that are complementary to what they need. Mm -hmm. They have talents we don't have, what are the but we have talents they don't. What are the most impactful things you can do for a company? Because you can't go to work with them every day. You can't, you can't build the product. You can't live it. But what are the things that you found you know, you can actually do that moves the needle. Yeah, it totally depends on the company, uh, by the way. Yeah, and, but what are the top two um, things? Yeah. The top few. Uh, the biggest one that I see at the seed stage is that more often than not helping them tell their own story. I think you yes. walk in with a company early stage, they're great engineers often, they're incredible technical capacity, but even in their initial pitch, they are just struggling still to encapsulate what their company does. By the end of most of those pitches, by this point, you, the three of us have sat in Thousands of startup pitches sure. know exactly how to tell a narrative. Just this week. <laughs> yes. Literally, <Hey. laughs> literally by the end of that meeting. And it, this isn't to, to knock anybody. I think there's incredible storytellers out there still at the founder level. For the most part, because this is a learned skill, we can tell a narrative often for a company better than that company can and can help train them how to pitch their company to different audiences, ah. to a founder, to a, a first hire to the press, to their first thousand users, to their first million users. Each one of those narratives is very, very different. And I think teaching a company how to be a, a soundboard of this is hitting the part that you want to hit. This is telling your narrative that you want to hit. This is missing it. Let's refocus on, you know, you don't have empathy for your users here. Let's talk about how this can be reframed. That is, I think, day one, the biggest impact that we can make. And frankly, we whether we invest in a company or not, we try to help sort of reframe that for companies. When we pass, that's often a lot of the feedback we're giving back. So somebody, we, we spent a lot of time like revising decks and and changing copy on websites, even for companies that we yeah. don't work with in the end. Yeah. Like, so it's funny. We've seen a cultural shift. You you were out in the web, even, you know, in, in technology well before I was. I mean, you were in that crazy movie where they where they followed all you guys. What was that we thing? We live in public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jo I mean, sorry, no, of Josh sorry. Harris I mean, in the 90s. Like when we were doing streaming media, yeah. It yeah was I mean, crazy. you were an OG's OG. But yeah. what you've seen is this transformation where there was an era in Web 1.0 where it was 
this whole sector was dominated by slick talkers and storytellers. At the peak, it became like just salesmen, sales executives. And, like, MBA. and the most important people in Silicon Valley were the investment bankers. Yep. They were the true rock stars at the yep. time. And so, because the whole journey was, look, have a tight enough story that you can convince somebody to give you the couple million dollars it took to start something. And go public with no revenue. And, and, and then ultimately have that VC pawn it off to another VC and have that VC who is usually an ex-banker get it to the public market and yeah. hope you could get out of your lockup before everyone picked up on the fact that your company was all bullshit and smoking yeah. mirrors. And so what happened was when that all collapsed, all those people left town. Yeah. They went to Wall Street, they went to these other places. Yeah. And the only guys who were left were the actual true died in the wall entrepreneurs and the actual coders. And so it coincided with the, the emergence of true open source. Right tools where now instead of having to have a multi-million dollar sun and Oracle development environment, you could literally just code from your laptop. Yeah. You're on and AWS instead of in 10 seconds. Instead of having a dedicated T1 line that costs thousands and thousands of dollars a month, yeah. you could just log into AOL and ultimately you got yeah. three megs of DSL to your house or you could go to yeah, an internet cable cafe modem, yeah, whatever, yeah. and you could start building. And so what happened was the storytellers left the builders through stuff like Y Combinator and that whole ethos that came with it of let's empower the builders started to rise. And there was a lot of improvement. The legal documents got easier. So that sure. was demystified. The fundraising process was demystified. Who actually a lot of wrote it was checks? standardized. Yeah. Who were the angels? Like Open Angel Forum was designed because nobody knew who the angels were. Exactly. They couldn't and find so, us. And so th there were all these obstacles to the traditional startup that were being removed and it was being really democratized. But the one thing that wasn't injected back in the ecosystem was the storytelling. Mm. It was just gone. Right. And so you would go to a Y Combinator demo day and you just bang your head against the wall. And you're yeah. like, those might be the smartest kids I've ever seen when I actually get into a conversation with them. But they cannot sum up in two sentences what the hell it is they're doing. No. But and, they can tell you the TAM no. and they can yell into the microphone. <laughs> well, they it's can certainly build it better than anything. I mean, There's too much yelling now. Over the years, they've certainly tried to invest in storytelling and it's become a little bit standardized and cliche, yeah, yeah, it's but back then comically. it was, it was, you know, the original demo days at Y Combinator were, were 12 companies running live code on stage, doing live demos, inviting yeah. VCs up to participate and try it out for themselves. And there was a lot of feedback and Q and A. And so these were much better. truly, truly talented, geeky engineers who were blowing all of our minds, what they were capable of building with so few resources. That was a massive change from the yeah. web van era. But they didn't have the storytelling capability. But they didn't have the storytelling. And so right. I would have answered the question the same way. First and foremost, that is the thing that I think is one of our competitive advantages. Yeah. And I think is the thing that that is so complimentary to these guys who have good product chops and good coding chops. But that last mile is missing of how do we tell everybody what we're doing yeah. here? I mean, look, none of our companies can actually afford to market, mm. right? It has to be a product that's not only intuitive to use, but we have to empower each user to be able to describe that product to another user. Right. Because they're our marketing force. The over the shoulder, here's how Uber works, here's how Twitter works, even Snapchat, which is impossible to learn how to use unless somebody gives you a walkthrough. I mean, you can't just figure it out, can you? But, but no, but, but the thing that Snapchat, first of all, you're old, uh, <laughs> and so old. let's be clear but about even, that. I mean, the even thing the original said version, today. like, I think that you had to like have somebody. But here's the thing, like, you, you know why Snapchat is particularly hard? I figured this out. Cause you don't swipe. Like swiping is a yeah. is that we are non-native swipers, right? right? So we think about the mobile We're native clickers. generation. We're, clickers. We're absolutely clickers. Yeah. So, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mobile native generation. Like I didn't have a cell phone in college. Yeah. The, the class just after us started to have cell phones in college. I had, a, I had a voicemail account I shared with my roommate that I got to check once a night, right? Yeah. And if I left the dorm and didn't know what was going on, I was going to miss the party. So we now have a generation of people who are native swipers. Yeah. And, and the, the only way to master Snapchat is to be a swiper. I, I think yeah. it's actually, it's different than that. I think it's actually, you have to tinker. Like yeah. this is a generation that just like, they don't want to read an instruction manual. They never want to be told what to do. Just give me the product. Let me play with it. And I'll start jamming on it and figure it out. The two of you just don't do that in the I, same way. Bullshit. We tinker with v yeah. VCRs and stuff. Like the only way but we got to where we are in our But are you tinkering yeah. with the social product like a Snapchat? It, or look, parents I, we, tinkering we with tinker the social with apps. I'll tell you what. When I look at I just think when I look at an app stuff in it, it what, is like yeah, a that's mystery. exactly right. When I There's look at an so app, so much hidden stuff. It is not There's it no is labels. not intuitive to me yeah. to be like, oh, if I pull the whole right. thing down, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. The yeah. whole core part of the app comes up. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, if you, and if I move okay. the whole thing this way, like, oh my gosh, there's oh, a whole will talk to people. Here's a framing of it. Kids will wander. In the yeah. sense that they will they will not have I necessarily think it's they, have so they will much jump time. in they don't ha they have time and so they'll wander yeah. through a product they'll discover things in a product in a way that like I don't buy it. you're discounting like the curiosity and tinkering 
are intrinsic characteristics of anyone yeah. in our business, yeah. of any entrepreneur, of any investor. Yeah. And so, but, and but literally the <laughs> gesture of, I mean, if there's, if there's a next wave of it and it's the three finger swipe or something like yeah. that, or the touch your nose, et cetera, that would not occur to me if I'm or like, the deep I'm click. stonewalled in this app. Yeah. yeah. I'm stonewalled in this app. Now what would I do? It, but there's a bunch of kids hiding anything in st- I just realized that I never use the touch. What do the they call it? The 3D touch. The, the 3D, force touch. The force touch. Yeah. I've never used force touch. Is there any hidden features in Snapchat with force touch? I think you, you can go directly. I think you can go directly, in, yeah, you you can directly to it faster, right? Home screen. Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen with I haven't seen ah. 10 yet with iOS 10. Interesting. All right, listen, before we went to this commercial break, I asked you about um, the disaster that is Twitter. Do you and qualify? I called, and, I, and I just called my therapist and she said, I should really pass on talking about this. It's just, I'm, there's, still a of, that? there's still a lot of PTSD. How many days a week do you got? <laughs> Two days? Uh, is it just for the Twitter therapist? Yeah. That's Twitter. a whole separate <laughs> a whole separate bill. <laughs> um, no. I mean, it's the most promising product. It's a that- $13 billion company, Jason. Yeah. So let's, let's frame it in some It context. was a $45 <laughs> billion dollar company last year or the year before. And it when has, none of us could sell the stock, just, when to, none of us, just to be clear, yeah. to bring up even more therapy and to, to really trigger you. No, liquid stocks will trade to crazy premiums, right? Right. Okay. So trigger warning. Um, but the thing has not been able to grow and that is the core problem. Why has Twitter not, and to have a, you know, sort of serious discussion of, yes, it's still an incredible product. The most important people in the world are using it every day, but nobody else is using it. It's not growing and not growing as we all know, candidly equals death. Why can't it grow after two leaders and hitting 300 million people and hitting great revenue numbers and still having the world's most important people on it hours a day? Why can't it break 500 million? There's, so I'll parse that into a few different things. It's funny to hear you say a sentence like, and it doesn't have anybody using it. There's 68 million Americans on the service. That's sure. more than the combined audience of MLB, NBA, I'm only comparing NFL. It, I'm only comparing it, it to the contemporaries. The amount, the amount of attention and time it gets yes. is eclipsed only by Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram at this point. It yep. is a huge cultural force. And I would argue that the users and the yep. audience of Twitter are even more influential, more impactful than the audiences of those other services. It's and the so, most influential people. So it's, and so let's. I, I do this to both give it its fair credit, but right. also contextualize why it's so frustrating. Yes. So the growth is very, very real. I mean, this is a product that should be growing organically. But it's but, not. But it's not because it's too hard to use. Still, that's the reason. Number too one. To so too hard to use. Like they haven't taken the obvious steps to eliminate the syntax you need to use. I mean, right. how many times do you see somebody start with an at reply and not, and, and they don't intuitively know that their users or their followers aren't going to actually see that unless right. they but unless the they follow the person. Yeah, it's just crazy. The yeah. dot, that's a broken thing. Yeah. You know, I, I watched an officer of Twitter yesterday yeah. DM fail again. Really? Like, I mean, this is you're like, well, how is this still <laughs> happening right now? Like what I watched, the, what was the I watched, DM I, I watched I'm not going to bust his balls. He's just, <laughs> no, uh, but <laughs> but I watched I watched somebody at Twitter say, "Look, in order to watch the the Thursday night football game that they paid a ton of money for. Yeah. Enter in this URL. That'll go into your browser. Then open it in the app, and then you'll load this card. And you're like, what Are you kidding the- me right now? Like, like it's I it's an NFL game. Yeah, no, because yeah. I mean, think about it. They would do these great little specialized sites for the NBA games. Yeah. But I would post the link. I would f- have to hunt for it. I would post the link. Yeah. They didn't feature it to anybody. I remember like, holy cow, this is amazing. How how did this happen? Feed. It's just not there. So yeah. so this is a company that just hasn't gotten out of its way in making the product easier to use. Mm. And again, another layer of frustration there is that for every single person on the planet, I guarantee you there is stuff in Twitter that is uniquely interesting and compelling to that person. Right. I don't care what your interest is, what your obsession is, what your hobby is, There's what your background is. There's great accounts that you will want to read every it, day. It is in there. And maybe not the whole account. That's the other thing that you know. Twitter has always thought about things as an account rather than the atomization of the tweet, yeah. right? You get worried sometimes about opting into an account sure. that could be a full commitment. And yet there are incredibly, incredibly valuable individual tweets that come out. Yeah. There is no lean back way to consume tweets. Right. So I should be able to go right now. Let's say we spend three hours dicking around here. Yeah. I should be able to open up Twitter at the end and just see Best what of. were the most popular tweets that happened Absolutely. while I was stuck here, like punching the while clock with away, Jason Calacanis, right? Yeah. And so like you've seen this now with Nuzzle. 
an investment of ours. Yeah. Nuzzle does that for all the news and links that we're in Yeah, your you're feed. like, here's 10, and it's like, they're all bulletproof. They stack rank them by yeah. what the engagement popularity was in your feed, and yeah. that is always time well spent. Yeah, But the you fact that Twitter wrong. can't do that and can't do something with just stack ranking tweets by popularity, I mean, they've tried with the algorithmic feed, but they're overthinking it. Mm. They're trying to bring too much science to something that is just so easy. Give me the greatest hits. That's just it. shut the fuck up and give me the greatest Top hits. 10. That's it. They literally could call Don't waste 10. my time. Top Don't waste 10, my please. time. How do you put something in my feed that says, while you're away, and it has zero fucking likes on it? Yeah. Like, why do I want to see that tweet? Yeah. Give me the most engaged stuff. So all stuff. that auto-magical, machine learning, AI signaling stuff that Facebook does with their feed, where you just, you don't miss the most important stuff, they just haven't figured but out. But Facebook, act, I mean- it's funny, we, t we we give a lot of credit to AI and we, you know, everyone acquires all these sure. startups, et cetera. But Facebook, really all they do at the end of the day is they just accelerate the things that have the most likes on them. Yeah, <laughs> like that's, and comments. That's really what they're just putting. They just sure. look at engagement and they're just like, this thing, I don't even need to know what's in it, but yeah. if everybody in your graph is talking about this thing, then the odds are you're going to want to know about it. For sure. So sure it's they do the targeting easy. and sure they do the, the the siloing around you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, let's get in the echo chamber. That's all interesting. But the number one thing they do is just look for the yeah, most resonant content. Baby announcement, bar mitzvah. That's why it goes. Whatever. Everybody, you you had twins, everybody favorites your twins. And so right it doesn't top. even need to know that your kids are cute. It's just like everybody in this graph should probably see this thing. Cal Canis normally gets X hundred likes on something. You just got X thousand. Everyone What's needs the, to see this, even if it's seven right. days old. Hey, everybody. I'd like to welcome a new partner to This Week in Startups. Our family continues to grow as our ratings and the viewership program continues to grow. All these great guests. And uh, our latest partner is Dollar Shave Club. I love this product. I have been shaving every day with the executive blade. I love it. I've never gotten such a clean shave. Uh, I've been using this Dr. Carver shave butter that they do. It's the smoothest I've ever had. It's like this really thick, buttery. You rub it into your beard. And then this executive blade... I have to say, like, I had to, I've had to adjust my shaving because my old blades, I had to like really dig in there. Now I just glide it right down with that executive blade and love it. Um, you can go to Dollar Shave Club right now, pick a razor from the lineup of amazing blades, and you never have to deal with the drugstore hassle uh, or get these locked up razor fortresses ever again. You can just very easily get them delivered right to your door. And it's really cool. The packaging is very tiny. It's very discreet. You have this nice little bag. You open it up. And it, I don't feel like it's wasting any uh, environmental problems or anything. It's just very efficient. And never having to go to the store again or think about my shaving again and just having that daily routine taken care of. And I'm throwing the blades away and I'm using fresh blades on a very consistent basis. I've locked in to Dollar Shave Club. It is the answer uh, if you want to get a great price and have quality. You're not going to make a decision over quality or price, you're going to get incredible quality at an incredible price. I absolutely love it. So here's your call to action. This is what you got to do if you're a super fan or if you shave. <laughs> Dollar Shave Club is so confident in the quality of all their products that they're going to give you the first month free. That's right. Just pay the shipping. After that, it's just a few bucks a month. No long-term commitment, no hidden fees. Get the first month free. DollarShaveClub.com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T, dollarshaveclub.com slash twist, dollarshaveclub.com slash twist. I absolutely, sincerely love the product and been using it every day. You will look, smell, and shave like a million bucks without paying for it. Literally, you know, I don't need to read commercials for a living. I've done okay as an angel investor. I would not steer you wrong. I genuinely have gotten the best shave of my life with their executive blade. It is amazing. Go ahead and go to dollarshaveclub.com slash twist and get the best shave of your life at a really fair price. And just think of the cognitive overload. You never have to think about shaving again. I love it. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. So Jack's had a year in there. He's a halftime CEO. He's working around Square. You were very publicly supportive of him. Adam Bain's done a great job. This last Thursday, they talked about selling the company. They didn't talk about selling the company. A lot of people. The outside board of the company. meeting was about selling the company. I know this. How do you know that? I know. Just because you you read about it with everything. No. no. There was a. It's on the table. That it's on the table. Let's just put it that way. So if it's on the table. The door's been open for a while. The door's been open for a while. Let's see, call it what it is. So what would you like to see happen? Would you like to see it be bought by somebody? And if so, who? Or would you like to see a change in leadership? 
what is what would Chris Saka like to see happen? Yeah, but so I was a very vociferous advocate for Jack to get yep. back into the company, but that was part of a broader deal. <laughs> yeah. So Jack, as a halftime CEO to me, made more sense if Adam Bain were really elevated to a true operating COO running the company President, type role. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and in parallel, I and the other shareholders that we, you know, that I was representing in that in in those talks really wanted to see Evan Williams come back and have hmm. a product role in the company, even if yeah. it wasn't a formal title as a product role. Yeah. But I think Evan Williams is the most visionary product guy in this space. Yeah, for you sure. Know, two and a half years before the Periscope deal, he was pounding the table about live video, live video. We got to have live video. Yeah. He just sees it. You, yeah. Evan's a buddy of yours. Yeah. It's, it's really disorienting to talk to him sometimes yeah. because he's living three to four years in the future of sure. web and social. You know, people kind of joked about Medium and now they realize it's a behemoth. Mm. What he's built there is going to be Huge. one of the most powerful traffic generators that the web has seen for yeah. long form content. And it'll be very easy to monetize when the time comes. And we're seeing massive publications move their stuff onto his platform. So the guy sees what's happening. And remember, he built that company from 2 million users to, to 200 million users. Yeah. He has a deep understanding of audience. He doesn't excel at telling a public story to the investor class, to a board of directors. It's just not his game. He's not a yeah. schmoozer. And that's what caught up with him in the in the you know the kind of palace intrigue of Twitter. Yeah, but the game of he Thrones. has a true product vision, and I really wanted, and I and I wanted everybody, everybody else wanted to see him back in. Yeah, that was my. Position. What I think we ended up with, unfortunately, was a result where we have Jack halftime, and we get a lot of talented performance for him out of that halftime, and the employees really like him. Yeah, he has the gravitas of the founder and inventor of the product. Clearly. Ev is not that deeply involved. Yep. And Adam Bain was not given all the responsibilities that I think people expected a COO to be given. Right. You know, uh, within months after the after the the transition to Jack as CEO, he still had something like 11 direct reports. Mm. And that's an impossibility to do with a half day. Yeah. And so I think without a really streamlined management team that's not bottlenecked on a halftime CEO and without real product vision, yeah. it's a company that's going sideways. Yeah. You know, I'm really impressed by Adam Bain's success in monetizing the users they have. They have over monetized as far as I'm concerned. The platform is brilliant and the video stuff that he's been put in charge of has been gone really well. Well, I think the transition from, you know, text to video yeah. is not only in step with the evolution of how mobile, you know, the direction we're all going with web and mobile uh, and content, but it's also the only way that company has been able to accelerate its monetization in the face of no user growth. Right. So take each user and make those users who are engaging more Increase valuable to the platform. Yeah. yeah. But ultimately there's a ceiling, there's a ceiling on that. And yeah. so time for a, a change as a shareholder. And I, and I mean, I guess the way I would describe it is, um, I, uh, I certainly don't own all the shares I own at the IPO because I'm not an asshole, but I own more shares than I should because I'm an asshole. And yeah. so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm still- You're sticking with them. Uh, I, You're a diehard. I am not all in on the stock, but I still do care about them. Yeah. Partly because of this, you know, it's, it's, like, the, it's like the kid who, that you're raising who has so much promise. And then yep. one day you lift up the mattress and there's like heroin needles and you're like, come on, you could have been <laughs> something. You could have done like, something like, here. Oh man, and you get the note from school that they're not <laughs> showing up to class. And you know, and you're like, they're not showing up to class and they're skipping their job. And you're like, shit, what did come I, come on, get I mean, I together. thought I cared for, didn't I show you love? Didn't yeah. I nurture you? Like what's- God, all those hikes, you, all yeah, that time. Yeah. So so it's very it's very frustrating from that perspective. And it, um, Is there a what, natural buyer? There is, and here's why. So who's the natural what's it, buyer? What's it suffering from? So it's suffering from distribution. And okay. you've got platforms out there that could easily add distribution to this thing, whether Google, it's Google, Facebook, Facebook Microsoft. Microsoft. These are these are platforms with massive distribution. Yep. Apple, easy ways to get this thing in the hands of more sure. users. There's no doubt about it. Growth right. could be accelerated immediately. Right. Um, you've got teams within those companies that are able to take a fresh look at products and make them simpler. Yeah. And so I think right now one of the things that that Twitter suffers from is everybody who works there is a power user of Twitter. Right. And so rarely do they get any fresh eyes on the product, on the product at yeah. all. And so everybody who works there knows how to use DM. Well, apparently not one of the yeah. corporate officers, <laughs> but, but, but everybody you know, knows this weird syntax, knows how to work their way through the app. But so they don't actually see a lot of the obstacles to this. I think it would be very helpful to the culture there to be exposed to another company. Yeah. But what do they have? They have a unique information asset that nobody has. It's Facebook a no-brainer for Google to own it. Facebook has obsessively tried to go after that. 
Yeah. And and they haven't been able to replicate it. They, they have can't get better information faster than everybody else on the planet. And they also didn't get government either, yeah. right? And they didn't get news. Nope. And so they tried. They tried with pages and stuff like that. Like, yeah. And with all their publisher deals, they don't get it as fast. They're now resorted. Yeah. Facebook, the mighty Facebook, has now resorted to paying off people to use their products. Yeah. That's how bad it got for them that they couldn't make any inroads so they finally started cutting checks to influencers correct so, yeah so yeah, but, but i'll tell you what i mean with that in mind so they have this unique asset what do they do they gave it to google for free like in exchange so twitter trying to chase mau's monthly active yeah. users to try and keep wall street happy is trying to generate some source of inbound clicks so they give all of their index results to google to include up at the top of the page it makes google users very happy because now sure. they have the best real-time results on search. It's awesome. And all they get are some incidental clicks back to Twitter and a, and a process that's way too hard to log into, et cetera. I mean, yeah. you choke on it. Yep. And so Brutal. remember, the very first revenue deals we did in the history of Twitter were- Bing and uh, Google. Finally. And Google, yep. And we gave them access to the fire our, to the fire hose. It wasn't even called that then, yep. but we just gave them access to our whole index that they could find. I remember the very first time we met on that. I was- Twitter didn't have a business guy. So I was, uh, as an advisor, I was their business guy. I was negotiating this deal. Marissa Mayer came in from Google yep. and said a stat, I'll never forget. This is 2009. She said, we just looked at your index and you guys, 62% of the URLs in your index are URLs that our spiders had never seen. Wow. So that is that is yeah. in 2009. Crazy. Think of how polished and successful Google's web crawler already was at that point. Yeah. And we had all this information they've, they've never seen. And it's only gotten better since then. And they paid us tens of millions of dollars for access to that data back then. Yeah. Right. And Bing did the same thing from from the Google side, by the way, or from the Microsoft side. You know who negotiated that deal for Microsoft? Satya. Wow. He, he was literally the guy in the room negotiating that yeah. deal back then. He's, He's been a believer. A job now. He's yeah. been a believer from the beginning. Yeah. He knows the value of that data. So Microsoft's the most likely buyer. So I think there are a few buyers. I also think some of these guys are going to have to play defense to each other, mm. right? Google cannot let Facebook get such valuable and unique information. Right. It will, Facebook it will would buy it in a heartbeat, but it's a regulatory issue, isn't it? No, 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 no. Well, look, these things don't get caught up in antitrust because strangely enough, what happens is when two web companies or two internet companies combine, they're framed against the total market that includes IBM and other computer services stuff. Yeah. So this stuff never gets blocked actually. Yeah. Uh, but so the there are also, um, there is another group of buyers who are just pure financial buyers at this mm. point. The Verizons, the Comcast, the world. You've got a company right now that's doing billions of dollars of revenue, still sure. growing. And you look at the multiple and you look at where the Yahoo deal just traded and you look at where the LinkedIn deal just traded and you're like, you could just really as a suit in an office, make a case for why this thing makes sense. Particularly if you have an existing ad network mm -hmm. and you can scale across the ad packages you're already buying, get that much, or you're already selling, get that much more reach. It makes perfect sense for those kinds why of buyers. Just so buy medium and put Evan in charge again. Does Evan not want to do it? I, that's what I speculated would be the best solution. Right I think now. one of the challenges for being a public company in today's era, and we go back to storytelling, mm -hmm. is that there's a demand upon you to be both an incredible product person, a visionary, and people, employees yep. look up to, but also have the gift of gab to manage yeah, so you send and inspire Bain the confidence. Yeah, so you send president, and yeah. you have Ev, like, you know. You know by the way, they that. never would. Isn't that frustrating? They never, like, just he's let Adam best. Bain do he's, all the press. Make yeah, him president. Bain, Bain is the best talker in the company. And they of never course. used to let him go out and do that stuff. He so. should do 100%. When Jack was on CNBC after he took the job with the big beard, and he said to the person, I don't think people should be judged on how they look when they asked him about the beard. It was like, really? You're just become CEO, and now you're making a moral stand on people. You're insulting the host of CNBC that he is judging Dude, you based on your looks. Are like, people... I mean, people listen Are to you? this, right? They can't see yeah. me putting my head in my hands. <laughs> it's just like, dude, <laughs> it was a joke. You have a grizzly bear beard nobody's ever seen before. You look like Luke Skywalker at the end of episode seven. Well, what about like, we haven't seen you in a year, and you show up looking like Luke Skywalker on an island in exile. Well, what about, dude, you've got a company who lost 50% of its market capitalization. Yeah. It's in turmoil. The CEO is on his way out. Yeah. And to... To go on CNBC and say to the entire investing community, it's just going to be business as usual. Like that was where everyone just like, take my shares and just light them on fire. Let's yeah, roll up I'm these done. certificates and smoke them For sure. at this point, because we might get more return out of that than actually holding on For to this sure. thing. For sure. Heads, down. Heads and, down. And I think, so what- So what, why not just so, buy so the challenge, medium? So, but the challenge is, so Evan Williams 
talented product visionary. Yes. But Evan Williams, his his core strength isn't doing the interview. It's not doing the earnings call. It's not going on CNBC because Evan Williams doesn't speak in sound bites. He Evan doesn't Williams need to. Is the philosopher king of yes. the internet. It's time for the return of the king. Evan Williams, <laughs> I, I will tell you, most succinctly, Evan Williams is long form. That that's yes. who he is. Of right? course, he is. His essays are incredibly thoughtful. Yes. The conversations with him are incredibly thoughtful. Yes. The prelude, when you get into a jam session with him, you give him some room and he has a prelude and a contextualization. Then ultimately he builds and he starts standing up and he gets excited about the conclusion. But ironically, Evan Williams is not a 140 character guy. No. And yet that's what the market and that's what the attention demand from a CEO right now. So you said Look bands. around at these people who are excelling with their yeah. storytelling. Look around. I mean, Elon, who's a great yeah. buddy of yours, yeah. is not only a product visionary, but God, that guy knows how to tell a story. He right? does now. Yeah. He didn't then. It was very interesting. You know, he used to make fun of blogs when I first met him. He's like, "What? What do you do?" I'm like, "I have a blog business." He's like, blogs? <laughs> you do blogs? <laughs> and then like his his ex wife started doing blogs, and he would make fun of us at dinner. How's your blogs? <laughs> and I was like, "You should do a blog, and you should be on Twitter talking directly to people." He's like, "Oh, you want me to tweet? I'm gonna tweet." And I was like, "Now he's like the world's greatest tweeter." He, and yeah, it drives hilarious. the market capitalization of the company. But it, to, yeah, I mean, to take this a step further. Like Donald Trump is a 140 character guy, a disaster. Yeah. No like, substance, all sizzle. Like 18 miles yeah. wide, 300 pounds, you know, <laughs> heavy and an inch deep. There's nothing there. He has not read a book in his life. I don't even think he read the book another guy wrote for him. No, that that I he don't put think his he knows the, the guy. I, yeah. Literally, <laughs> if he met the guy who wrote the book, he wouldn't recognize him. <laughs> right. I don't think he's met the person who wrote his book. But I think I think the market right now, both the investing market and the public demand these figures who yes. are TV ready. I mean, look, you've, you've heard me say, yeah. I believe Mark Cuban will be president of the United States. For sure. There, there is no doubt. So I think the United States over indexes on their faith in billionaires. I think they yeah. consider business success to be the ultimate arbiter of your worth as a person. Yes. I, and I'm Mine saying is right. it's, re, it's ridiculous. No, I, I'll get into a fight on Twitter with Cuban, who's a good buddy of yeah. mine. And they'll just be like, Shh, literally people will be like, shut the fuck up. His stack is bigger than yours. Exactly. And I'm like, so so it has nothing to do with the merit of my point and <laughs> no. Cuban being wrong right yeah, now. Chip stacks. Yeah. And that, and by the way, who knows this better than Trump? Right. That's why the guy has gone to such extreme lengths to lie about the money he doesn't yeah, have. Yeah. He's like, because literally, he knows America gives a shit about the total. Yeah. When they find How out he's worth six hundred million, they're gonna be like, you fucking loser. You're worth six hundred million. You piece of shit. The only, it's like it's six hundred million dollars. I have a big private jet. Fuck you. The only person who would nickel and dime their own campaign, their own foundations, is a guy who doesn't have the cash yeah. to do it right. He's short. Like he he doesn't he's have he doesn't have that. And billionaire after billionaire have been calling him out on it. Yeah. And he he talks shit, but he will not provide no. a, a modicum of, if of evidence. You to had show. a choice. Google or Facebook buy um Twitter at double the current price, or they buy medium and Evan William comes in and has to grow it from here. Which would you rather do? Double your stock share price and get out or Ev Williams at the current price? So do we take it private with Ev Williams? That's what I would love. Okay, I would yeah, love and if, then that's the third choice. I would love if Evan Ev Williams- Evan stays private or Evan takes it private. I, I, I would love, and this isn't going to happen the because there aren't the cash flows and you, profitability to finance an game, LBO. But, but let's play the game. If Evan Williams were given the opportunity to run Twitter quietly, privately, with a long-term vision again, there is no doubt he could- make the kind of radical changes to accelerate user growth, to simplify the product. Again, took it from two to 200, it's not hypothetical. You take it from 300 to it's a billion. It's not hypothetical. He did that, yes. right? And and I think what he didn't do was along the way, shine the board on like, hey, look at me, I'm, I'm accomplishing all this stuff. Right. And go out and make the rounds at all the conferences and, and, and really build that brand yeah. as the enigmatic kind of high gravitas CEO. Yeah. That was a real challenge. And I think that's what ended up sneaking up on him in that case. But yeah. if we had the opportunity to have a real product visionary in there building it the long term. So you just need to have some huge private equity firm buy it and make it proper. It's just not going to happen, though, because what Why? happens Too is, big? well, a private equity firm buys stuff by borrowing against it. Uh, and you finance the borrowing by cash flows. And we have a company that has great revenue, but isn't profitable from cash flows. You don't have anything to finance the debt mm. on that. And so that's just not going to happen. I mean, look. The other thing you have to look at with Twitter, you have to admit too many people work there. Stock-based compensation is way out of- You think you have to cut half the people. I, I mean, I, who knows what the number is? I don't, I'm people not, are saying like, half. Hillary Clinton got in trouble for saying half. And so, you know, Donald <laughs> Trump got in trouble for saying half. Some. Yeah. 
So some of the people, many, well, when did they say many half? people are saying oh, they said that half yeah. of his people are wing nuts, right? Yeah, sure. Half of the people are, it's a basket of deplorables. deplorables, but he also said half of the people in this country are carrying the other half because half the people in this country don't want to work for a living. Yeah. Uh, hey, but, nobody mentioned to him that they're over 70 and under 18. Like when he did the statistic, it's yeah, like, it, by the way, the people, not a large percentage of people not working are opting to not work or they're not legally allowed to work. Anymore. When you want to start your politics podcast, let me know. I'll be on every episode. Ah. <laughs> just, just as a uh, catharsis. Out all right. It. When we get back from this break. I think I'm supposed to do a break, right, Jake? When we get back from this break, I want to- such a power move, by the way, to like talk to your producer in real time. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. I know Stern is like your yeah. biggest influence for yeah. this. I would say Stern and- um, It really just builds a Charlie lot of Rose. authenticity into it. Yeah. So am I allowed to tell- But am I allowed to tell that. everybody that there isn't actually somebody here? No, no, no. We, just have, <laughs> we, have, a, we have a recorder. I set this all up and hit the record key. There's <laughs> producer Jake, producer Jackie- <laughs> Um, can, can you ask associate producer Julia I, uh, to handle this for me? Are we, can we just make up names for your fake director and Absolutely. fake up makeup person and stuff like that? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, He's got a whole whack pack right here Absolutely. on camera. Absolutely. No, you know, interesting thing. Um, <laughs> I had a radio company, two different radio companies actually approach me and say, we listen to your podcast. One of them is a local station. One of them delivers through a different mechanism. We'll leave it at that. And they were like, hey, we want to talk to you about maybe you talking about things other than just tech and business. Huh. Would you be interested in maybe doing a drive time radio thing? And I was like, Interesting. When is Stern is retiring in what have four you, years? What have you always wanted to talk about? I would like to have a podcast where I talk about politics and entertainment and just everything else and life. I would talk about the other topics for sure. I, I would love to see you have the Arbitrary Wheel of Bullshit t podcast where there's literally a Wheel of Fortune. Yeah. With just spin. randomized topics and you've got your Vanna White equivalent who just spins that thing. Yeah. For sure. And then all your guests have Matt, to just you're available rip, to spin the wheel? I will be that. Vanna. Yeah. All right. When we get back, I want to ask Matt about me. this esports team. Because you bought an esports team. This is true? It's not a room. Yes. I didn't realize yes. we were going to get into this. This is one of the oh, more God. embarrassing chapters. And I want to get into it. Well, no. It's Proud. just... Awesome. Matt owns he, he owns right. a share of some geeky kids. All right. I want to know what's going on in Matt Mazio's esports team house. We'll get back on this week in start Startups. Hey, everybody, I want to tell you about the second year of us partnering with IBM for something called Smart Camp. We had a great partnership last year, and now we're on to smartcamp2016.com. It's a startup competition. It occurs in 20 cities from around the world, and you can find your city on the website, smartcamp2016.com, smartcamp2016.com, or you can find the city closest to you, one you can get to, and you can apply. Applications are closing in a few weeks, so I need you to apply today. And if you win, you're going to get to pitch on stage at the launch festival or the scale conference, and you're going to get mentored by local IBM city leaders, and you can compete for a chance to be a finalist. So you're going to pitch on stage in your city, become a finalist, you're going to crush it, and then you're going to come to the scale conference, or the launch conference. It's going to be great. The top 10 finalists get to come to the launch festival in the spring of 2017 here in San Francisco. They get to meet with me. You have lunch with me. It's great fun. And the top three finalists are going to present on stage at the launch festival in front of thousands of people. The winner will get $25,000 from me and come to my exclusive incubator, the launch incubator. Last year, Carforce went to the uh, incubator and received an investment from me. I actually doubled my investment in the company, went from 25 to 50. And you will become the IBM Global Entrepreneur of the Year, a title you want to have in your pitch deck when you go meet with investors. So go ahead and visit smartcamp2016.com and start your journey. It's gonna be an amazing conference, an amazing competition, and you're gonna learn a lot, and you might wind up getting an investment from me, Jason Calacanis. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. Thanks to Jay Martin for his iTunes review where he said Twist is the best podcast for startup news out there. Leave your review on iTunes and be featured on the show. 